All right, guys, we're back with another episode of the Minhaj Podcast. Today, we're welcoming Ryan and Paul. Hey, Paul. Hey, Ryan. How's it going, Minhaj? Thanks for having us. Hey, Minhaj. It is Pleasure going to be really, here. really good. How are your summer preparations going? Do we got flip flop flops out? We got shorts. We got sunblock. Ryan's got well, those. Well, I live sure. in Miami. He's, he's based yeah. in Miami. That's right. I, I I always have sunblock out, uh, but a little bit more sunblock than usual, I suppose. Uh, and yeah, it's great. Um, even... Our summer plans are taking the little one around to his uh, ancestral homelands. Uh, he's 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 in Japan right now. He's visiting Canada uh, with us after this. Uh, part of part of being a uh, an expat lifestyle is that I have to travel a long way to visit the grandparents. Uh, so I guess there's trade offs, but uh, we're really excited, and it always makes for a really exciting summer. Good to know. There isn't much of a summer there, Paul, is it? Uh, it actually does get pretty warm in Denver in the summer. But it, right now, it's really nice. It's like 70-something degrees and sunny most days. So it's a good time. Denver is a fun place. Got any rock climbing um, lined up? That's right. There's lots of climbing. Lots of climbing, which is which is one of the big reasons I, I live here. So luckily, I'm lucky enough to live just a few minutes away from nice outdoor climbing, which is how I spend a lot of my weekends. Paul, Paul and I have a lot of thoughts on being uh, co-founders uh, that we can explicate later, but uh, one of those is dealing with sort of tensions and disagreements in the relationship. And uh, one of one of the biggest challenges that Paul and I face is that I'm a beach guy and he's a mountain man. Um, but somehow we managed to resolve that. Well, we've got plenty of time tonight to talk about that. Uh, but let's start with um, Zenletic. Um, what's Zenletic, guys? And why does it have a Buddhist name? Well, I can, I can take the what is Zenletic, and, and Ryan can talk about the, the Zen part of things. Um, Zenletic is a business intelligence tool that uses large language models to make data just radically easy to access. So I would say that there's never until now been a self-serve business intelligence tool, a tool where business users can go in and get the data that they need without having to talk to someone technical. Business intelligence tools is, have kind of always been built by analysts for analysts um, with, with just not really a lot of regard to the actual end users who need to go and get data from them just as part of their job, not as their whole job. Yeah. And as for Zen, it was just kind of came out organically. Uh, I would say uh, uh, this, is, this is like that old quote about like, you know, great art critics talk about form and function and great artists talk about where to find cheap turpentine. Uh, part, part of it is it's like, you know, you're just back solving a URL. It's like, is this URL available? Yes, we have this. This is going to work really well. So uh, part of it is having the dot com. But then I guess the philosophy behind it uh, is, is that we want to make things simple, right? That's the whole the whole part of Zen philosophy. Uh, we we kind of said that is a great description for the name. Uh, one thing that Paul really quickly said after that is, right, we're not putting any, uh, you know, meditating people or like swirly, uh, you know, Japanese ink things on the website. And like, let's not lean too far into that and get really corny with it, uh, which I think is actually a really great approach. Uh, one thing, I don't think Paul actually even realizes this yet. I've just teed up a LinkedIn post on books that I recommend. But uh, on that list was uh, Zen and the Art of Archery, which is kind of a really cool classic book. And actually the the the, the spin on that is Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, both great books. Uh, and Paul, uh, I don't know if you ever knew this. I never actually told you this before. But uh, part of the reason why I like Zenletic is because I think that both those books are just really, really interesting and uh, just great reads. Has been, I recommend them all the time to people. So. There's, there's a slight nod to Zenlytic from those books. Well, I personally do think that there um, is kind of a sixth dimension of um, Zen in the product that you're building as well. I mean, we're going to be letting, later talking about the semantic layer. But before we actually get to that, um, do you have you ever used like Power BI and Tableau? And like, why do we actually need another tool, guys? No, that's that's a great question. And I would say not only have we used all the tools, we've set them up, configured them, deployed them in enterprises from you know small startups to Fortune 500s. So that goes a little bit into our origin story. Uh, we actually started as a company uh, when Ryan and I finished grad school at Harvard. 
um, we started consulting. We started doing um, everything from like data science consulting, like building and deploying uh, machine learning models to actually setting up these uh, data stacks. So that would be going in, hooking up data pipelines, setting up like a BigQuery or a Snowflake warehouse, um, and then putting a Power BI or a Tableau or a Looker um, or one of the other uh, open source BI tools on top of that stack. And the thing that we realized from that was that BI is very far from solved. Um, it's still a really big problem and it's still just way too hard for uh, business users to get access to data. And that was one of the big things we realized from, uh, from that consulting was that it's really not solved and that the tools solve problems for analysts, but not for the business users. Yeah. And, and there's a, just a general feeling, I think throughout the world of those tools of chaos, uh, you're just managing chaos and complexity and data is inherently messy data is difficult so uh another part of the zen objective i guess the opposite of chaos is, is is zen so like we we believe that it's possible to simplify that and make that accessible to everyone interesting and i was just wondering there's something that you're doing different with um your play your platform which is remarkably a remarkable departure from uh, what it's already being done, which is the semantic layer. I mean, you're not only using LLMs, um, and on top of that, you're going to make it more authentic. Um, and a lot of people um, are got a little confused when we talked about that. Um, and when we we're doing this, um, I asked my friends to have a look in Zenlytic, and, um, and that was a, um, a, a very valid uh, question like what's happening on semantic layer i mean either it's llm um and for the language part so that your inputs are understood but where does it fit in just explain a little bit on um uh, how did you come with the idea yeah so i would say like it's actually very hard you know the two are very intertwined it's next to impossible to use a large language model for data uh without having a semantic layer um the reason for that is the data is high stakes. You can't be wrong. You can't just come up with a new definition of revenue and report that to the board. It's got to be consistent and it's got to be, you know, correct. It's got to be how you calculate revenue. So if the large language model doesn't have access to the definitions to how the company thinks about data, it's not going to be able to work well in the first place. And then what the semantic layer actually is, is it's effectively the collection of definitions that a company has about how they define their metrics. So that can be, you know, if you're a software company and you talk about active users, that could be, what does it mean to be active? Okay, this is someone who logged in in maybe the last 30 days and, you know, at least went one page past the login screen. Um, and then what does it mean to be a user? This is, you know, some unique user ID, um, not an account, not a company, but an individual human being who's accessing, um, you know, this product. So being able to take exactly what those definitions are and give those definitions to the large language model so it's able to always accurately and consistently calculate these oftentimes really complicated metrics that seem like they should be simple, but are in fact quite complicated. Yeah, I would, I would uh, the, the long and short of uh, semantic layer is it's, it's a tool for translating uh, sort of business level communications and metrics and KPIs into something that a SQL data warehouse can understand. So it kind of is that bridge between sort of uh, the end user and the data. Uh, and you can understand why that would be sort of a necessary condition for attacking uh, the self-serve problem. Uh, the other necessary condition uh, I think is actually uh, equally important is, as you mentioned, the LLM side of things. Uh, interestingly enough, self-serve uh, amongst data people is kind of a, I guess a unicorn or like the impossible dream. So a lot of people who are deeply involved with data and business intelligence uh, are, are skeptical that self-serve can even happen. Um, and that's really that like, uh, you know, there's so many edge cases in the data and uh, the UI UX patterns are very difficult. And uh, it's, it's usually, you know, what self-serve ends up meaning is some sort of dashboard or something like that. But uh, it's very, very difficult to allow uh, someone to actually explore what's going on in their business without having to use SQL or Python. Um, I, th I think that those those concerns are all very valid uh, and self-serve is incredibly hard. Uh, and I think the two necessary conditions for it uh, now exist, but one of them is only about six months old, which is the advent of these LLMs. 
Uh, and there's something really, really powerful in the intersection of those two technologies. Um, essentially, they, they both add pieces to that self-serve puzzle, but they both have shortcomings as well. So, uh, you know, LLMs, for instance, incredibly good at comprehension. Uh, they also can, you know, as you know, hallucinate or sometimes they try and do math, uh, you know, in the LLM's head, which uh, can be wrong. And it's, you know, uh, some of these things are, are are kind of funny when you're just playing with it. If you ever want to do something really fun, go and ask uh, ChatGPT uh, your biography uh, and it will go and write a biography for you. And it's, you know, it's it's about 80% accurate. My wife and I did it the other day and it spoke uh, in depth about her time at Goldman Sachs uh, and all, all, you know, the roles she took there and the, the jobs she took and how she was promoted. And uh, my wife has never, ever worked for Goldman Sachs before. So, uh, you know, the hallucinations exist uh, and they can lie very, very confidently. Uh, and that's, that's funny uh, when you're at home reading your biography. It's absolutely catastrophic uh, for business reporting. This is board reporting, right? This is these are public companies. So uh, LLMs add a lot to the equation, but they also have their shortcomings. Uh, likewise, semantic layers add a ton to the equation uh, because they actually have that translation from business concepts, but you have to provide a front end for them to actually be accessible to the end user. Um, so that's, that's where the intersection happens, basically. Uh, the semantic layer governs the LLM. Uh, it makes it impossible to hallucinate, impossible to make up metrics that don't exist, things like that. Uh, it also does all of the translation uh, so that all the calculation can happen uh, in traditional computing instead of inside an LLM's head, basically. Uh, and when you combine those two together, uh, you kind of unlock this uh, new paradigm that lets someone chat with their data. Uh, and you know, our, our end goal is to emulate a conversation uh, that you have with a data analyst. Um, that's the real end state of, of business intelligence. And I think a lot of the previous self-serve paradigms would be someone, an end user would look at a dashboard, uh, they'd want to change something or dig deeper somewhere, uh, and they would go straight to either a Jira ticket or straight to their email uh, and email a data person. And uh, then there'd be a, you know, a conversation would ensue between the business user and the data person. Uh, you know, it takes a week or whatever to go back and forth and finally get the answer, uh, but the end user would get the information they need. Uh, our goal is to you know, replace that week-long process of back and forth uh, with an always-on instant sort of chatbot that can talk uh, like a data analyst and has access to the data in your organization. Very interesting. Um, any decent business analyst would cost you north of $80,000 in my experience. Um, are the ones who, are, who really know what they're doing, basically. And self-serve is pretty much um, the ideal goal is, uh, if I'm correct, um, is to kill that role um, more or less, or let's say, you know, less reliant on uh, a dedicated business analyst, maybe for the connector part and things like that. And I wanted to dig deep a little bit um, into uh, the semantic layer and how it actually makes um, self-serve possible. So um, I have had uh, Dr. Valit Seba on my podcast um, from Northeastern University, and he has some serious um, concerns, as everyone else, like uh, Dr. Marty, Marcus Gary, uh, Gary Marcus, um, and I as well. So I've actually had a uh, Twitter um, locking of horns with Jan LeCun about the capabilities of um, LLMs. Um, and uh, let's say that um, it's less than consensual, uh, the capabilities of um, LLMs. So dig deep a little bit on how Semantic Layer is fixing this hallucination problem um, and how it's actually going to take um, our beloved BAs out of the game. So I think the, the, the one thing is I would push back on it replacing analysts. I think it changes the role of analysts. Um, analysts right now basically are like Jira ticket machines. And that's not a good situation for anybody. It's not good for the analyst. It's not good for the person waiting on the, on the ticket to be completed. What analysts should be doing is what they're exceptionally good at, which is helping the company define those metrics. It's quite complicated to figure out how should you actually recognize revenue. Um, how should you actually count how features are being used by which kind of users and which kind of patterns? Um, those are the kind of things that you need people who are really data savvy for. Um, and that's, that's what I think the role of the analyst should, should move towards and should be more. They should spend less time answering rote questions. That's what, you know, Zoe, our chatbot, is amazing at. 
and they should spend more time making sure that those definitions are really well crafted because that's the thing that they are uniquely capable of doing that uh, the large language model just can't do very well right now. Is there a specific use case um, for um, Zoe that, uh, for example, if you talk about um, logistics and banking um, and finance and different industries, like well, what does it look like um, if you drill down a little bit um, on Zoe? For example, if you write um, in the I input section about give me the uh, our the top clients for the month of May um, when it comes to credit card consumption. Like, how does it actually uh, walk me through the process? Like, how does it actually interpret um, the input and, um, you know, furnish the dashboards? Yep. So, so crucially, when, when Zoe's asked a question, she's able to basically look at your whole company's context. So that can be all your metrics, your different, you know, filters you could apply, like entities, things that are happening in your business, basically. So we basically load like the business's context into Zoe's brain. Um, that's tough for a human because there can be thousands of tables, like thousands of metrics. It can get really complicated. Luckily, that's not a problem for a large language model. Um, Zoe then basically takes your question and compares it to all the business context and says, hey, can I answer this question confidently with what this person has asked? So in your question, like, you know, show me, show me top clients in the month of May. Um, maybe Zoe says, huh, there's a lot of different things we could rank those clients by. Maybe I need to ask a follow-up question here. And then Zoe will come back and say, hey, what do you mean by top? Uh, we've got a few different, you know, metrics we could look at. We could look at, you know, revenue. We could look at engagement. We could look at, you know, like contacts with support. You know, what do you mean by, you know, how are you trying to rank these basically? And then you could come back and say, oh, well, I was thinking revenue. And then Zoe will say, hey, great, here's the list. Now I know how to answer that question, and I can answer that question accurately with this business's context. There's there's a really interesting uh, uh, consideration here around like how LLMs work for information retrieval problems, which is what this really is. You know, there's several uses for these LLMs. There's generation of text and things like that, or coding. So there's like generative problems, but this I think is fundamentally information retrieval. Um, there's the two really common ways that people use LLMs to get information back, uh, the first one is actually having information that's trained inside the LLM, right? So inside the trillion parameters of GPT-4, uh, it has learned, uh, you know, how to write Python, or it actually has learned, uh, you know, when Martha Stewart's birthday is, and that's actually hard coded inside a parameter, uh, inside of you know that giant neural net, basically. Um, the second way that LLMs can retrieve information is uh, now you know by using plugins or browsing. So you can ask, uh, if you ask ChatGPT a question that happened after September 2021, 20, for instance, uh, it's training cutoff date, it can go and browse the internet and say, okay, let me look it up for you. And it starts actually literally doing what a human would and sort of checking websites and trying to compile that information. Um, those both have advantages and drawbacks. It's interesting because the, the former is, is very, very powerful. Uh, and very, very fast information retrieval, right? So it's like, it's kind of encoded in the brain, but unfortunately it requires that to be trained into the LLM, which takes, you know, months of training time. Uh, the latter is, you know, less reliable, but it can be used to access anything. And I think actually it's funny, the two paradigms there, it's a little bit like talking to uh, like a, a senior expert, you know, in a role versus talking to the new intern, right? So like the first senior expert is like, hey, what do you think about this? And uh, it almost has an intuitive understanding of that, you know, after, uh, you know, iterations and iterations of sort of that being trained in. Whereas the second is uh, the intern, where it's like, I, I have no idea, but I'm going to go find out. And then it just starts sort of aggressively looking around for the information. Um, those those both have their places. Uh, I think our approach is kind of cool with the semantic layer uh, because we've managed to find a third way to do that. And I guess our approach uh, allows us to stitch together. The semantic layer is traditional computing, right? Uh, whereas an LLM is a very powerful, very important, but it's also a new paradigm. Uh, our approach lets us sort of cleverly stitch the two together. Uh, so the LLM can use that comprehension, uh, but then access information in a very, very fast way uh, using the traditional algorithms inside the semantic layer. Uh, and that kind of gets you the best of both worlds. You know, it gets you... Uh, speed and accuracy without having to go and retrain the LLM for months and months and months and months. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, we're really excited by the approach. 
also just going back to your original question around like, you know, is this possible or not? And I think that's, that's a, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, good reasons to be skeptical of the capabilities of LLMs right now. Uh, I would just say two things in reaction to the doubts. I mean, the first one uh, is uh, LLMs. Uh, so these, these problems get much more difficult with domain size. And what that means is uh, if you have a very specific task, you know, driven uh, uh, AI, uh, it's a lot easier to train and get accuracy and performance out of that than if you have to have an AI that can do everything, which is one of the reasons why what OpenAI is doing is so impressive uh, is because it is very broad domain. And that's also one of the reasons why, for instance, you know, Siri has been so bad for so long. Uh, you can, if you go into Google Maps and you ask for address directions, it's actually pretty good at getting you there because it only has to understand addresses. Whereas Siri has to understand a huge range of possible tasks, right? So one thing we have in our favor here is that retrieving data from a structured data warehouse is, is in the grand scheme of things, a relatively narrow domain task. So uh, that gives us a lot of confidence. Uh, the other thing that I will also say is, as a, as a Canadian, I just love to quote Wayne Gretzky, uh, who used to play for my hometown, uh, but just, you know, skate where the puck is going. Um, the trajectory of this technology is unprecedented. Uh, I've, I've been through several platform shifts before in my career. Uh, I was an investor in mobile when the mobile platform shift happened. And, uh, those, those, those changes took, you know, years, right. It was like, there was a period of years between the advent of the iPhone and the development of the app store. Um, we're still like, even now we're still measuring stuff day by day, uh, in this AI platform and things are happening so quickly. Uh, I think that we're building on new capabilities at a very rapid pace. Uh, and, and even if uh, people are skeptical about the capabilities now, which are already quite impressive, uh, you know, I like to think, uh, you know, six months, 12 months ahead, uh, I think a lot of these things will be solved problems. I think one thing I'd, I'd add to that is that even if you cut off development of the foundational models right now, um, there's just a gigantic amount of human hours spent doing drudgery in like Excel or other sort of basic systems that large language models are incredible at like 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 right now yeah. as we speak there is a slew of 22 year old like accounting interns at deloitte and kpmg like looking at pdfs and moving those numbers to excel and making sure that those two numbers are the same and putting a little red tick next to them um that that kind of grunt work can already be you know i mean just effectively vaporized like, like that's kind of what we're trying to do with you know these analyst questions it's like you know, there's a lot of just rote, basic questions, almost the same thing as the analyst was asked two days ago, not quite. So she's got to go in and change things. Um, it's just these things that are, that are so rote and so sort of mundane that even current technology um, with, with no more advancements in the core, like large language model could just completely change the way uh, businesses operate. Yeah, um, we're definitely going to circle back to talk about the AI boom versus doom. So we are we are split into two teams uh, across the board. Uh, that would be a good topic. But right now, I want to dwell a little bit on um, how um, Zenetic works with the uh, complete dashboards and tiles. So I used to work in a call center way, 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 way back. Um, and what it does is that, you know, you have a huge gigantic screen and we had like uh, incoming calls and how man, many of them are being dealt with and how many are in the queue so people are uh, on updated on this mat metrics uh what's going on and i was just wondering when i was playing with zoe i found out that um you can have a conversation with zoe um in a back and forth manner um, and i was just wondering if there's an option um, that once you have the answer um, from zoe we could actually make a tile out of that and put that in the main dashboard so that you, they, they are updated. So essentially what I'm thinking um, as um, the king of the lazy people, that I would just simply ask a simple question and then make it a tile and you know that would automatically create a dashboard so I can go to sleep for the rest of my shift. Yep, well, I mean, we, we can do that right now, but the catch is you just have to click those little three dots in the response and then um, add it to the dashboard manually. The two new features that we're pushing soon are that you can just tell it which dashboard you want to add to without clicking those three dots. And then the other feature is actually that you can tell it the whole dashboard you want to create, and it will make the whole thing for you, where you can say, hey, you know, give me a dashboard with uh, call volume, call velocity, you know, everything trending over time, hourly, 
um, and make that run in the last week um, and then add, you know, empty filters for like call origination, um, average call duration and stuff like that. And then it would just create the whole thing for you. Okay. That yeah. is really interesting because, you know, now you made someone look like they work really hard for their living. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, they, they've still got to go through and use their, their expertise to make sure that it is in fact what they think it is because, you know, maybe it adds a, like a, you know, a different call origination. Maybe there's two kinds of call originations and it picks one. It's not quite the one that you were looking for. So there, there's, you still need a human in the loop to make sure that, you know, the finished product is what you want it to be. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a, a theme. Um, we'll... Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, I think it's a theme we'll see a lot, by the way, uh, throughout this discussion and in the coming months as well, as I think human in the loop is, is kind of the name of the game for practical, uh, you know, applied artificial intelligence. I mean, of course, you got to do some work, um, you know, it won't work without that. <laughs> uh, and let's take a little bit of divergence um, here and I talk about how did it all start? You know, two guys uh, meet at Harvard, you know, uh, started grabbing coffee, um, talking about uh, analytics and, and that turned into the analytic. Is that the simple story or is there more behind that? Yeah, so Ryan and I, um, so we met at Harvard. We worked on basically um, all of our projects together there. Um, and then we we got started working together, actually, even while we were still in grad school. We um, we did some consulting work together and then moved uh, right after we finished grad school into like full-time data consulting. Like I was talking about we did everything from machine learning models to you know setting up these analytical stacks, configuring BI tools for companies from startups to, to Fortune 500. Paul carried me through that program, by the way, is what he doesn't like to say. Uh, it's actually really funny. That was one of the places. As well. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I went back and did a master's degree later in life, uh, mostly just out of passion. It was actually really interesting for me. And this is also one of the one of my own personal experiences uh, that drove home the need for, for no-code self-serve solutions. Uh, is that I, I used to be, you know, at the, st at the start of my career, I was a sort of a low-level systems developer. So I've, I've always been a bit of a nerd engineer, uh, but I spent a long time away from that, uh, investing in venture capital before I got back into it. Uh, and in the time that happened, a bunch of programming languages had emerged to be popular. Notably, Python is the most important one, actually, that happened in my technical hiatus. So when, when I went back to do this data science master's degree, uh, the, the first day of the, the course uh, was the, the first day I'd ever written any Python. Uh, Python is the most important language uh, for data science and machine learning. I think everyone would agree that. Uh, and, uh, you know, you work almost entirely in Python in, in throughout the, the, the coursework of this master's I mean, degree. Are you uh, going to be happy and, with your answer? <laughs> was that? Our users, they won't be very happy with that. <laughs> Really interesting. That's <laughs> is there is you don't think that uh, oh I, you don't think that Python is the, the lingua franca or that you're saying people don't want to learn Python. Well, that's quite a debate actually. You know, people there are people who are um, avid supporters of R over Python, and they think R is uh, more potent. And but I think I'm on the Python camp. So you're right. Well, yeah. I think I think the 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 R Python split is there's a lot of academia versus industry there. Academia likes yeah. R because it has a lot of these complicated built-in statistical programming uh, things. But if you go to a, to a real-life company, um, they, they need to then turn these models and these statistical things into you know something that actually runs in production. It's pretty difficult to get R code to actually like run in production um, compared to Python. So R users will yeah. dispute that. But if you go inside of any organization of size, when they're deploying stuff, it's probably in Python or C++. And yeah. it's just so easy if you do the development of the model in Python to then just turn that into an actual service that's that's running in your application. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, Absolutely. I mean, we were, were almost there to become a full partner with R Studio as well. And that was one of the concerns of our clients as well, that, you know, deployment of R, um, that is going to be a challenge. Um, but I think that's going to be less of a problem now with the Onyx system. Um, but we're going to look at that. Right now, we're going to circle back um, to Harvard. And one of the questions, when you uh, 
by the way, um, congratulations. You have been sponsored by Sequoia and um, Bain and you know, other big names um, for your uh, funding. And one of the things um, that I, when I talk to startups um, is that, you know, it's easier to get that funding um, when you go to big name schools like Oxford and Howard, like you guys have been, you're very well educated. Um, is there an element of truth to that? Or um, is it just um, if, if you're good enough and if there's um, a semblance of um, probable success uh, about your startup and they're going to fund you anyways? That's a good question. Um, so I would say there's the, the first thing about this is uh, team is very important, especially at the early stages when you're fundraising. Um, probably more important than a lot of people like to acknowledge. Uh, it's one of those things that people sort of also say flippantly, but it's it's 100% the truth. And as someone who's both been on both sides of that equation as an investor and as someone who's fundraising, uh, when you're raising a pre-seed round or a seed round, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the team is the vast majority of that decision-making process. Um, so first off, absolutely, it, it is important to be the right person for the job. Uh, I, I would say, though, that, uh, you know, pedigree or big name schools or organizations are just one of many paths uh, to satisfy that team bucket. Um, it, it is a path. Uh, I'm not going to lie about that. And I think that uh, that's that's one way to show that, uh, you know, you're uh, willing to work hard or ambitious or whatever that shows, I guess. But uh, it's certainly not the only path. Uh, it's actually probably not even the strongest path. I think probably the most attractive way to show value for uh, uh, that you're the right team for the job uh, is to show fit with the problem. Um, and what I mean by that is that I think the most attractive teams to me when I was an investor were people that had you know lived the life of the customer previously, uh, who had you know, really, really had sort of visceral exposure to the problem that they're trying to solve. Uh, and quite often, uh, you know, the teams that come in from fancy schools are the opposite of that, right? They haven't really lived that problem. So uh, Paul, Paul and I were lucky that I, I don't actually think it was the fact that we went to Harvard that uh, made us a, a good fit for a pre-seed round or a seed. I think it was actually the fact that uh, before we started Zenlytic, uh, we ran this consulting business and that consulting business let us sort of live the eyes of many, many customers and uh, very viscerally experience the problems that we were trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that too. I think, and I think if you, if you look at kind of the, the people who are able to hop out and, you know, raise really large rounds um, very, very quickly more so than the brand name schools, it's people who come from kind of brand name companies and have worked on a similar product internal to that company. So um, they've also just, you know, empirically had a lot of success. Um, if you built a machine learning platform for Uber that was really helpful for Uber, um, you got a pretty good chance of going to a VC and saying, hey, we built this for a high growth company that's now public and it worked great and they needed it. Uh, we want to go and sell basically that same product to a bunch of other companies. That's a really strong case. And um, in my opinion, it's, it's hard to get stronger than that if you're just at the team stage. So I'd wholeheartedly agree with with Ryan. And I just want to... Sure, go ahead. And and I just can't emphasize enough the, the importance of that team and the early stages of fundraising. And it's funny because, you know, I was an investor for many, many years and I kind of knew that and I always paid attention to that. Uh, and I still felt like I learned a lot when we went out for our pre-seed round and, you know, we tried to, we were, we were essentially raising this round pre-product. We tried to sound as impressive as possible when you had these great plans and, uh, you know, these great screenshots and, and everything. We tried to put all these uh, sort of best feet forward. And I thought we did a great job of it. But after the fact, I, it was totally clear to me that, the investors first saw right through that facade and they were like, okay, these guys are really, really early. But they also didn't care because they were investing on, you know, their, their faith in Paul and I. Uh, and, you know, I've gone back after the fact with conversations with all of them and it's like, yeah, it was, it's really 100% about the team at that stage. Just, just being a great fit for the problem you're solving uh, and giving the investors the confidence that you're the team to solve it is a hundred percent of the job in the pre-seed and pretty close to that even uh for a long time after that i think that would be a good question to ask to you who has um, worked in the vc industry for a long time um and uh, was also played poker semi-professionally so you know 
hopefully you have this poker face analyzing, you know, startups and their lies. Like what, what are VCs looking for? You know, I, I'm pretty sure that you'll get tons of wonderfully slick gift of gab pitches about how this is going to be the next Uber. So what are you looking for? Yeah, that's great. So I would, so first off that will change as the round changes. And uh, in the earliest stages, there's actually the, the two most important things are team by far uh, and underappreciated actually is town, uh, the size of the market you're going after. And, you know, in Paul and I's case, business intelligence is one of the world's largest software verticals. So that's not an issue. But, uh, you know, VCs at the earliest stages, they want to make sure that if you succeed, you can achieve venture scale returns, right? So over time, that evolves into importance in how good the product is and how well the product delivers. Uh, all the way through this sort of a more numbers driven approach uh, as you, you know, I'd say, you know, the product is important, the seed A stage. And as you approach sort of BC, uh, it starts to become a lot more about traction and a lot more about uh, sort of the underlying fundamentals. I would say throughout that, throughout that process, you know, the, the, the important things that you're solving at every stage that you're communicating at every stage uh, is, you know, why is this the problem? Why are we the right team to solve it? And why now? I think that a lot of people who are fundraising do a really good job at the first two and they focus on those, but they under index on the why now. So if I were to give my, my favorite piece of fundraising advice is to really focus on that. And when you're, when you're pitching a VC, a big question in their head is, okay, so this is an important problem. You know, why has not this not been solved in the last 20 years? And what stopped other teams from doing this? Or, you know, if this was important and solvable, someone else probably would have solved it already. So why now? Uh, and I think communicating that is really important. Uh, that's why VCs are always looking for that sort of platform shift opportunity, right? And so, for, for example, you know, a lot of the enthusiasm now with LLMs is, uh, I think VCs who agree with us that this is the next big platform shift and this is going to drive a lot of change. So with that change comes opportunity. Uh, and, you know, with that opportunity comes a great venture investment. So I would say there's a lot of things that they look for when when you're fundraising, focus on the why now. Yeah, it totally makes sense, actually. One of the things I wanted to ask about Zenlytic is that when you use Power BI, the whole ecosystem of Microsoft is behind that. So that means that you have the connectors, um, data is coming in from some kind of data warehouse, and then you have downstream tasks. Um, they also have mobile apps and uh, the desktop apps. While Zenlytic, you chose um, the cloud uh, platform for that, which is available as a web app. And I'm just wondering, um, do you intend to go down the path where you would have, and I think self serve um, the the whole purpose of self serve is that you know uh, you're lying down in your bed, you know, getting a cup of coffee in the morning, and you know, see where are my stats, uh, and being able to query small things, um, and that would only happen uh, if you have mobile apps um, or an iPad app, uh, or let's say even a desktop app. And I'm just wondering, was it a conscious decision to only use web app, or is it in in, in the pipeline, or like what's your uh, your view on that one? So I would say we already have mobile app and an iPad app. And that app is called Slack. Website. Okay. <laughs> because since we integrate with Slack, since we integrate with the communication tools that people use in their day to day, you can just wake up, ads analytic, and, and we do this on our own Slack for our own metrics. And we can say, ads analytic, you know, how many queries have people run in the last week? Boom, number pops up right in that Slack thread. And if we want to ask a follow up question, we can. If we want to move on to something else, we can do that too. And that lets you take data from this previous tool that you had to go to, whether that's a separate app, people don't want another app. They want the data to show up where they already live. And that's an email, that's in Slack. So our approach to that is basically, you know, since we have this conversational interface, it actually integrates in Slack pretty flawlessly. Because um, you can just ask these same questions you would in the UI, get answers back just in Slack instead of in a UI. And we found that that's a really powerful integration and a really powerful usage pattern. But don't you think it's it's a very mid journey stick um, experience where you just go and you know uh, create images and you know just by a input and that's going to work same um, in Slack. And some people would just prefer a, a, an app that only does what you're looking for. 
I think that's I think that's true. But I think the other thing is that generally the person who we're serving, who really wants like self serve to work, they don't want another tool. They don't even want to log in somewhere. They just want someone to answer their question quickly because this is not their job. Their job is not to go and get the data. Their job is to do something else, to run marketing campaigns, to you know increase throughput of the sales team. And they just need data to do that job effectively. So for, for them, they just want to get things as easily and as quickly and as simply as possible. So there's definitely benefits to using RUI. And just like there would be benefits if you could use a mobile app that we built specifically. But I think for, for most people, just having it right there in front of you is, is the thing that's, that's the most game changing. That's the 80% of the, of the 80-20 rule. I think I think Midjourney is actually a great example of that, which is Mid Midjourney is a pretty bad user experience, in my opinion. I don't know if you've used it extensively, but you try and generate a new image, and you know there's a million people in this one chat room who are trying to make images at once, and you lose yours, and then it's like, uh, you know, someone's trying to make a picture of like you know some sort of weird cosplay thing that's pushing yours off the screen, and uh, it's it's not the easiest thing to use. You know, even getting into Discord and figuring out how to set it up is is a real pain. But it is incredibly popular because uh, it does the best job, and you know it gives you the best quality images. Uh, and you know my my real job to be done there is 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 like, hey, listen, I want access to really amazing quality AI generated images, and, and Midjourney is the best for it. And that's why I, as far as I know, it's probably the most popular tool for that right now. I I come from. I come from the era where there it actually was a, a very strong advantage to be sort of beautiful and easy to use. And you know, there's a there's a period over the last call it like you know, five, six, seven years where apps really focused on minimalist, you know, make it really, really work well, highly polished, you know, focus on the corner radius of one of these buttons kind of experiences. And I think I'm the I'm the I'm the strongest voice on that in the Zenlytic team, but even I have to internalize the fact that a, a lot of enterprise SaaS users are most focused on the job to be done. And I, you know, you look at the dashboards in Salesforce, uh, and you know, they look like they're like this like weird 15 year old terrible design, uh, but people still rely on them because they get them the information they need. So, you know, our our number one goal has to be delivering on that. You know, it's getting the people the information they need at their fingertips. Uh, as quickly as as effortlessly as possible, and then after that, I think comes making it beautiful, and that's something I'm always going to be pushing hard for. And I think it's always going to be a part of Zenlytic, but even I'm starting to accept that the first thing you have to do is satisfy the user need. Yeah, totally. Getting your priorities um, in order. Man, I, I have used Midjourney, and I can you know agree with the experience. It's pretty bad, even though what you can do is you can invite the bot to your own server, and then you know you can ask private questions. Uh, if I may, uh, mm-hmm. but one of the things um, I noticed it with your product is that since it's a web app, there isn't much enough option uh, for the clients who want to use it on-prem uh, for the security um, and let's say uh, for you know more compute power. And I think uh, for a lot of companies who are very um, worried about uh, you know everything on prem, for example, defense industry or the banking industry, uh, or let's say um, stock market and financial uh, fintech companies, um, th- that's a, a strong concern of theirs. And I was just wondering, like, w- what is your sales pitch for them? I would say so. So first of all, we have no plans ever to offer an on premise uh, version of Zenlytic, and I think the that that goes back to kind of the quote that Ryan said earlier, which is skate where the puck is going. I think one company that sort of led the charge in this is Snowflake. The biggest, like Snowflake's biggest customer is Capital One, the bank. Because Capital One, you know, invested a lot in migrating uh, their data assets to the cloud, migrating a lot of their actual compute infrastructure to the cloud. And they've been able to move just incredibly fast as a company as a result. So I think even like highly regulated, you know, Industries that historically wanted a lot of on-premise stuff are moving more and more to the cloud. So that's the trend. And we as a company are able to have just a product velocity that's, you know, honestly, just absolutely next level, not having to manage hundreds of, you know, different on-premise deployments and software updates and things like that. So 
Uh, we we have no plans to offer an on-premise version. And I would say, you know, if someone's not willing to, you know, have their data like on the cloud at all, then that's just probably not a good fit. Because I would say in our experience, most companies, even fintechs, you know, highly regulated companies are are moving to the cloud. Yeah, I uh, I actually kind of compare it to like 10 years ago when people would look at Amazon and they'd say, are people going to put their credit card numbers on the internet? Uh, and there is, there is sort of societal hesitation around, you know, credit card numbers on the internet, which of course is long since changed. And I think the enterprise version of that is, you know, will we go in the cloud? Uh, I think I think we're actually well into that transition now. Going back to Paul Snowflake example, uh, I think about five years ago, something like 25% of corporate data was stored in the cloud. Uh, I think now it's getting closer to 75%. And I guess our our philosophy too is that like that that's the that's the canary in the coal mine for us. Uh, if if enterprises are willing to store their data in the cloud. And this is, you know, very. This is PII. This is this is this is data. Data. Uh, if they're willing to store that in the cloud, then we're comfortable that they will be able to process that in the cloud as well. So, and and, and your know, cloud offers many advantages, as as Paul says. It's like you're you're not busy worrying about managing your own internal instances, and we can ensure that uh, every user has the latest version, and there's no version control. There's all sorts of software engineering problems. Uh, that have gone away with the move uh, to the cloud, uh, and I would just say empirically, it's it's been working very effectively for us. Uh, and we work with some, you know, very large financial services organizations. We work with HIPAA sensitive organizations. We work with G many, many, many GDPR and CCPA sensitive organizations, and uh, we're always able to de deploy those effectively in the cloud. Yeah, I hear you. Actually, the funny that you should mention um, Snowflake. You know, I've had on my podcast um, Bill Inman, who's the um, was known as the father of uh, Data Warehouse, um, was also um, the um, inventor of the Inman um, school of uh, Data Warehousing. And we talk about uh, Snowflake versus Databricks, um, and you know, he's on the Databricks camp, and um, I was just bantering with him. You don't like Snowflake just because it's Australian. Like, where do you guys stand? <laughs> so, so you know, they're they're both incredible products, but they're they're good at different things. So, you know, I definitely agree with with Bill that his you know the data warehouse is an, is an architecture, not a specific product or like you know a specific like technology. So, that, I think that's like probably the most important point. But then I would say it depends on your use case. Like Databricks is going to be, you know, more useful for something where you're trying to, you know, run basically arbitrary code on really, really large amounts of data, like code being like Python or something like that. So for development of machine learning models, Databricks is great. I would say for like traditional analytical use cases, it's basically impossible to beat Snowflake. It's um, just incredibly performant, you know, like a dream to manage. Uh, roles and permissioning are really easy to set up, really easy to, to administer. So I, I would, you know, I'm, I'm, we're very, very pro Snowflake. Yeah. Did that you doesn't mean we're anti data bricks? By the but way, it just feels like we get a lot more demand from Snowflake. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering before you um, chose Snowflake, did you evaluate data bricks um, for Zenlytic? So when we were actually starting Zenlytic. So, so, so first of all, we work with like any, you know, SQL based warehouse. So, you know, Databricks's new like SQL based warehouse is absolutely the, the kind of warehouse that we would integrate with. Uh, when we were starting the company, though, that wasn't even an option. Databricks hadn't launched their uh, SQL based interface yet because because the, the origins of, of Databricks and Snowflake are really in, in the two camps of what they're best at. Snowflake's always been a, a SQL based, uh, you know, like SQL powered data warehouse. Whereas Databricks came from, you know, running really, really large scale, like Spark jobs that would let you, you know, create machine learning models, uh, run arbitrary Python on, you know, really, really large data sets. And then, you know, Snowflake has moved more into Databricks' territory and Databricks has moved more into Snowflake's territory. So now people, you know, view them as uh, these, these like really tough competitors and they are really competitive now. But even just, you know, five years ago, they, they weren't really in each other's turf. Uh, the way they are today. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see what the next year or two brings as I think they continue to sort of get become more and more overlapping. I think there'll be an interesting showdown. Uh, we're already starting to see it, but I think it'll probably be intensified. We even saw, you know, it's, it, even even now, Snowflake and Databricks have their conferences at the exact same week, for instance, which is kind of funny. So you have to choose which one you're going to go to. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that sort of competition does intensify over the coming you know quarters and years. Oh, well, they're a pretty uh, great team behind Databricks, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah, I, I would say both teams are absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, the, the Databricks team, they just executed on product in an, an incredible way for managing these just extremely large scale Spark instances. And for Snowflake, I mean, mm-hmm. their their leadership team is incredible. Like Frank Slootman, you know, took ServiceNow public and they're one of the biggest SaaS companies in the world. Um, and he's now, you know, growing Snowflake at about 100% a year. So they're they're both incredible teams. You You couldn't go wrong <laughs> working for either of those companies. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the problems uh, in startup life, no doubt. And one of the things that has proved to be the hardest is to actually acquire um, paying users. Um, And that has always been intertwined with the burn rate um, of the funding that you have uh, and then hiring the talent uh, and managing it in a way that um, your product becomes household name or at least um, is integrated into other uh, daily products that people use in their lives um, so that uh, it becomes um, indispensable. I'm just wondering, what are some of the challenges that you guys face when it comes to getting Zenlytic to people's desktops? Yeah, interesting question. Do you want to do you want to go first, Paul? Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of different things to unpack there. The the one I think that's probably the most crucial to talk about is the hiring piece. I think that's something that we've done very well, but strategically is maybe different from other companies. So we don't hire like just, you know, crazy fast. We hire quality. And you know, that's a strategy. Like you could hire a lot of people really fast and have more manpower, uh, more, you know, just humans doing stuff than we do. But I think generally, especially with engineering, it pays to take the time to hire people who are really, really good and really good fits. And I think we've done a great job of that, honestly. Like our our team is absolutely fantastic. And one of the reasons in engineering, it, it pays to like have that quality versus quantity approach is that the fewer minds you have developing a system, like the fewer people are architecting, you know, how Zenlytic works, the simpler it is. So the more we can have really high quality people who can do amazing work without adding a ton of minds who are trying to develop things, uh, it makes the product simpler for everyone who uses it. And, and that really benefits everybody. One important thing to clarify there too, you heard Paul say, that's a strategy. Uh, that's kind of like a coded internal thing that Paul and I use. Uh, it's worth sort of explaining. Uh, you know, we, we always say that if the opposite of uh, a strategy is ridiculous or silly or not a good idea, clearly a bad idea, then it's not a strategy. It's a best practice. So for example, you know, good customer service is not a strategy because bad customer service is obviously just dumb, right? So a strategy has to be something where there's a, a good decision on the other side of it as well. And so in this case, having a small team uh, is very much a strategy because there's also merit in investing heavily in larger team with more capacity, and, uh, for instance. But then there's drawbacks with that as well. You're managing more people. And, you know, so I guess we always think about that, the things that's to determine, like, is this a strategy or is this just a best practice? And to Paul's point, having a, a, a manageable team is very much a strategy. Going, going back to your original question about some of the learnings from Startup Land, I would, I would actually draw a clear line between pre and post product market fit. And, you know, we're, we're post PMF now, but in the pre PMF stage, it's, it's quite interesting. And it's, uh, there's, there's a very big difference in your approach to those two paradigms. Uh, when, when you're pre PMF, uh, you know, you, you think about your runway in terms of experiments, right? It's like, how many things can we try and change and add with this product? big or small, and they could be very large changes at that point in time. How many, you know, how much time do we, or how many changes do we have uh, with the current runway that we have at hand? Uh, so, I mean, that's, you, you're thinking very much in broad strokes about how this solves people's problems. Uh, and at that stage, interestingly, the, the sales process 
is a lot like the investing process in the sense that it's actually more about your team than about anything else. And it's, you're looking for your believers, you know, you're looking for people that trust that you will deliver value to them. And they, they acknowledge that the product is still evolving heavily. So uh, they're, you know, your, your customers are really investing and believing in you more than the product at that stage, which is, which is, I think, a misunderstood part of pre-PMF sales motions. Post-PMF is really interesting because then it becomes a question of speed versus efficiency. Uh, I, I like to think of it like, you know, you're driving from New York to Boston and you're in a Tesla and, you know, you know, your Tesla is, can go 60 miles an hour or 90 miles an hour, but the battery efficiency goes way down if you're going 90. Uh, and it's it's a question of, you know, how hard do you put your foot on the gas then, right? And at that point, you're balancing, uh, you know, there's, there's there's an overall product heartbeat cadence that that is underlying all of this, but then you're also balancing your levels of investment in various channels and experimentation, you know, explore versus exploit. You know, you can try new un, untried channels. You don't know if those are going to be effective or not, but uh, it's it's how much do you invest when? And this is, I think this is an unsolved problem because we've seen this go back and forth. The pendulum swings back and forth depending on the market. Uh, right now we are in and probably slowly starting to leave the be exceptionally efficient phase of the market. You know, two years ago, it was growth at all costs. And uh, so so uh, that that approach takes sort of a delicate hand on on the lever and some, uh, you know, thoughtful focus on explore versus exploit. I think are the, the two big names of the game at that post PMF pre, you know, huge giant enterprise uh, phase of a business. Yeah, interesting post PMF is a perfect segue into um, another interesting question, which is um, when we talk about platforms that you're trying to build, I think the brilliant idea you have here is to do with dashboards what Bubble has done for uh, the web development. And I see you, um, Ryan, you were on uh, a podcast with the founder of Bubble and, and when I was researching it before this He's podcast. Great. And there was a wonderful conversation about that. And, and the idea, I guess, what you guys have uh, had this prescient vision that you know, if web development can be automated, why not dashboards, self-serving um, on top of LLMs and uh, semantic layer? It's a brilliant idea in the sense that you know, why not shorten and fasten the process um, instead of you know going, doing everything manual? And I was just wondering, how do you actually see this uh, no-code evolution boil over to different industries, and do you think it's going to unleash a whole? era of RPA automation, like how, how's that going to future look like if everyone took this idea of no code and built, started building things? Well, I would, I would actually say like the, so, so it's like, there is definitely, you know, no code in the sense that you're not writing code. I think one thing that changes actually is that our approach is actually a lot easier than, than sort of traditional, like what you would call no code in the sense that, you know, you basically still have to do most of the things involved in coding, you're just doing them, you know, in a in an interface or something. So it's like Webflow, for instance, uh, is a no code tool for building websites. You can go in there and move all these blocks around, and it takes care of, you know, kind of translating you moving these blocks in the UI to, you know, what code actually gets run at the end of the day. I think the next generation of of enterprise, you know, applications are going to have an approach similar to ours, where they're using large language models to be able to take even that complicated interface that you've still got to figure out. You still, you still have to learn Webflow. There's people who put Webflow on their resume. It's, it's, it's still like a, you know, a skill that people learn. Whereas, you know, I think increasingly, you know, you're going to be able to see people do just really powerful things inside of products without having to like learn that product specific interface. So for instance, you know, really the day that we onboard someone, they can pop in and ask Zoe questions. They don't have to figure out the nuances of how to click on this thing versus that thing. And, you know, like how to, how to do all these kind of like in the weeds, you know, operations in the tool, they can just ask. And I think that's going to be the trend of the next sort of wave of enterprise SaaS apps. I would actually also say to your, to going back to your question that the you know, the arc is is long or however the quote goes, uh, but like I feel like the arc of the universe is towards 
less code, more automation. And it's, you know, over the course of my various sort of uh, professional involvements in this, like I, I've, I've witnessed the start of my career, uh, I was writing stuff in assembly language for like, you know, microprocessors. And it was very, very hard to do and very, very verbose and lousy. And, uh, you know, then someone, you know, popularized C++ and people started using C++ and then they use C to write Python. And now people use Python. And uh, I think that we've, We've really, uh, it, it kind of goes up and down. And, but if you look over the longitudinally, uh, the history of technology is, is really a series of higher levels, higher levels of abstraction uh, and you know, easier to use tools, right? And as soon as we popularize a new tool, the first thing that people start doing is using that to build the next tool, right? And like, I think case in point is we're starting to see uh, a reality where stuff that would be considered, you know, coding or technical is, is getting pretty accessible. So Python, I keep coming back to, but that's a, a relatively understandable language. And, you know, you're seeing situations where a lot of the bulge bracket banks are training their IB associates now in Python, for instance. So like that, that might be where things uh, really start to meet. But I think just as, as we go on, there's just, you know, more and more powerful tools being built that can achieve those jobs with less code. I think we're actually probably going to see the next step change in that happening because of LLMs, I think is the next big unlock in a lot of that stuff. There's an old, you know, you know Moore's law, uh, when you look at the curve from far out, it, uh, it appears to be very smooth, right? And it's like, okay, these processes have gotten just smoothly better over time. But when you zoom in, it's actually a series of step changes. Uh, so, and we see these, you know, technology unlocks even at a macro level and uh, I, I think probably in the grand arc of things, LLMs are going to look like it's just part of the big smooth curve. But what we're looking at right now uh, is a step change ahead of us. A million dollar question time, guys, which is, is AI going to take my job? Are people going to be killed by uh, UFOs and, and unseen army? Uh, is um, our LLMs smarter than us? And now we have to worry for our children and uh, everything else there's a lot of doom and gloom going out and people genuinely believe uh, there's been a report that 4000 jobs have been cut by ai or well, thanks to generative art and anything else but do i really have to run for my life so yeah th this this answer is definitely going to depend on on who you ask i'm very very positive on large language models so i would say you know we can only speak about stuff that exists right now right no large language model that exists right now is, you know, broadly speaking, like super intelligent in the sense that it's like smarter than a human. They're amazing at certain things that humans are bad at, like memorizing things, reading gigantic terms of service documents and finding small little errors in them. So it's like, they're certainly better than humans at lots of tasks, but I'm generally very positive on its impact. For basically the history of humanity, we've consistently been inventing tools and consistently been worried that the tools we invent are going to kill us or, you know, basically irreparably damage society. I mean, ever since the Luddites and the invent of the loom, you know, people have been saying, this is terrible. This is, we're going to lose all the jobs. What are people going to do if we don't just make shirts by hand? We found other things for people to do besides make shirts by hand. And I think AI is just Much another better step things in that to direction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's going to get rid of a lot of the drudgery, a lot of the things that, people frankly shouldn't be doing like you shouldn't need a human being to look at a PDF and tell you that that number in that PDF is the same as that other number in that Excel file. I mean, that's just you human shouldn't be doing that. We're not even very good at it in the first place. And it's just not something that yeah. we should be doing. So okay, I, my view on is a very, very tactical very level. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. On a very tactical, the thing that we're replacing the quick data poll that what a, an analyst would do is terrible. It's awful. And like, even, even, Someone like Paul or I who absolutely love this stuff and it's really neat to think through hard problems like this, but you go in and you're grinding around all these tables in a data warehouse and, uh, you know, just trying to make stuff work and there's all these little syntax and it's just a slow moving, you know, taxing process, which is just not fun. It's like people don't like to do it. So like, uh, I feel like we're automating away some very unpleasant tasks, I suppose. I, I, I would say I'm totally with Paul, by the way, I, I'm not worried at all. Uh, I'm going to present the the strongest case that I've heard in favor of the Doomer argument is actually from, you know, where I said it's like, 
I think the strongest case is that some people who I think are really, really savvy on AI. So people like Jeff Hinton, and I think recently Jan LeCun, for instance, have, have spoken out about you know their concerns for it. Uh, you know, Jeff Hinton quit Google over it. And he's essentially like, you know, they call him the godfather of AI and he uh, he understands this technology more than anybody. So the fact that they are willing to speak out about this uh, is the number one thing that would give me pause. And it's like, OK, like these people know more than I do about this and they're expressing concerns. So I respect those opinions. I still I'm not concerned about it. I would say. I completely agree first with Paul's uh, statement about, uh, you know, it's going to be a valuable tool for people to actually go and, uh, you know, get better at the jobs. And we can, we can, I can also explain later how I think it's going to impact jobs. Uh, I think the Doomer argument does not worry me at all because all those arguments rely on this kind of rogue AI runaway that can train itself to be smarter and faster and, you know, build the next AI very, very quickly, for instance. Uh, and for all of the impressive things that we've seen AIs do, uh, it just feels like there's so many technological limitations to that happening. Not even structural limitations that we put in, but just fundamental ground up technological limitations uh, that would be very unlikely. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that, which is, you know, for a, an AI to train a new smarter AI, even if it was capable of doing that now, when we when we train a model, it, it takes months, right? So like, you know, GPT-4 was, you know, I, I, as far as I know, a year plus of, you know, training on a whole bunch of compute. Uh, and it's not the kind of thing, it, it took a, a societal effort to organize the amount of compute required for that and the amount of time that it took uh, is not something that a rogue AI can sort of slip past us and, you know, make happen without us noticing or under our noses. And even when you factor in increases in computing speed or efficiency or whatever that situation is not going to be the case for a long, long time. So uh, I just feel like there's technological limitations uh, and just empirical limitations. Like we've we've seen dramatic capabilities and in increases in the tools. I, we've seen no evidence of, uh, you know, an AI being able to run away and, uh, you know, become a threat or anything, you know, dangerous to us, I suppose. And empirically, actually, we've seen pretty pretty effective applications in some of the constraint tools. So like, you know, RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback, uh, appears to work remarkably well in, in governing GPT-4 because it feels like it's quite a safe entity. And, you know, even, even now you can't ask it how the best way to build a bomb is or something like that, right? Uh, and there's other technologies, uh, you know, I know that Anthropic uses the constitutional approach. And uh, these appear to be effective actually at governing uh, the safety of AIs uh, anyways. and. There's also just further technological limitations that would prevent that from happening. So long story short, I think uh, I, I have very little concern about the Doomer scenario. I do think it's going to change jobs, and we can, we can start talking about that too if you're interested. Thanks, guys. I feel much better. <laughs> <laughs> so on that uh, wonderful note of feeling better, let's talk a little bit about um, not your work. You guys have been doing some interesting work even before uh, Mr. Analytic. And uh, starting with you, uh, Paul, you made some kind of telescope. Uh, I'm going to pretend that I understand uh, the complexity of that. So I'll let you explain that. Yep. So so, uh, so luckily, I was not in charge of the telescope. That would not have worked out well for anybody. Um, but we were looking at data that comes from the telescopes. Um, so this was a, a grad school project that Ryan and I had both worked on. The problem basically is that there's a there's an entity in um, Boston called the Minor Planet Center. They're the entity that's tasked with making sure an asteroid isn't going to hit the Earth and kill us all. So it's a pretty important thing. But when we when we worked on this project, they basically have this large file of sort of partial observations where it's like, hey, we saw a little bit of that, but not enough to plot an orbit, so we don't know if that's going to hit us or not, basically. And they have millions and millions of these, of these observations where they're just not quite sure what asteroid that is, if that's going to hit us or not, what the orbit is. It's just sort of unclear. And the problem is that doing the you know, in-cubed problem of matching every single thing in that gigantic file to every other thing takes months to years on a gigantic supercomputer. And that's a long time to not know if anything is going to be a problem. So... 
you know, what we did is we basically came up with a, a better approach algorithmically that instead of running on months or years on a supercomputer, uh, runs overnight on like my MacBook. And that approach lets telescopes, which are running this in production now, actually go and in real time, as they collect these observations, they're able to just run this on like a simple cheap computer, uh, as opposed to having to build like giant data centers at each telescope to try to run, you know, the old algorithm for this. So well, long story really short, it wasn't from... to that. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, well I, I wouldn't, by the way, I wouldn't make any podcast uh, bookings after November 1st, uh, 2032 uh, for no real reason. No, I'm kidding. There, they didn't, there was no uh, dangerous trajectories found. But yeah, it was really interesting because it, it shortened, you know, by using some really cool sort of machine learning techniques and just some really clever uh, math, this, this algorithm shortened it from, you know, months or years uh, in a data center of like massive computers uh, all the way through to, uh, it was actually Thanksgiving weekend on Paul's MacBook Pro uh, to solve, you know, the trajectory of all these asteroids. Uh, so massive, massive speed up. Uh, and it's also worth noting, by the way, that that was done in conjunction with the the Minor Planet Center and the director of the Minor Planet Center was also on the project. Uh, his name is Matt Holman and wouldn't have been possible without some of his brilliance, uh, uh, all of his brilliance with regards to understanding uh, astrophysics and, you know, uh, a, you know, a ton of work with him. Yeah, speaking of brilliance, um, how is your brilliance working out for horse betting? You know, that's an interesting thing I know about you. <laughs> I mean, do I have better I odds working that. with you to maximize my profits in horse betting than stock trading? <laughs> wow, you really, I got to say, Minhaj, you did your homework. I'm, I i don't even know how you heard about that. I, um, uh, so I'll just say, you know, I, I find gambling fascinating. You mentioned I was a semi-pro poker player uh, back in back years ago, I guess. And yeah, the horse racing was was just a really interesting side project for me. I will say, so I will say that I think my, my position on it is I would stick with the stock market. Uh, and the reason for that is that the stock market is just a much bigger market. And going back to like, you know, what lessons can you take from gambling for startups? Like you still have to think about things in terms of TAM. Uh, and the stock market just has that bigger total addressable market, I suppose. Horse racing, uh, there have been people that have been very, very successful in that. They their, their takeaway is they actually took it to Hong Kong, for instance, is I think the biggest market for horse racing. And and they were early in the process. So like they're the first people that figured this out were able to really uh develop, you know, smart algorithms for uh outbetting other players. Uh, but the important thing is that most most gambling games, including horse racing, are are they're like a zero sum game, right? So you're you're betting against the other players in that betting pool, uh, and as the other players get more sophisticated, your edge tends to decrease, right? And over time, those edges get thinner and thinner as the group collectively gets better at betting. And you could even see this when I was playing poker. I, you know, I was playing just after online poker sort of became legal and popular. Uh, and everyone is getting into it, and it was it was very soft. And then over over the years, uh, as uh, sort of the bad players got weeded out and the good players practiced, just the quality of the play increased, so that edges would actually decrease. Uh, the same thing happened with horse racing years before I got involved with that. And this is really just a hobby of mine. But I would say that I, I don't have any data on this, but my intuition is that the largest, most popular sort of betting markets for horse racing are probably fairly efficient now. Which means those edges are pretty small, and it's it's difficult to make a whole bunch of money at it. One of the things that I did when I was playing around with it was actually to go to the smaller markets, and I'm not even going to say which markets because I want to keep those ones inefficient. But you know, the less popular, less popular markets were were definitely softer in the sense that you could make a higher you know proportion of your your bets you know would make money basically. The catch, of course, is that at the smaller markets, those bets can only be those, those bets have to be smaller because the pool itself is smaller. So I would say horse racing is if if you're the absolute best at it, there's probably still uh, lots of opportunities. But it would be a full time job, and if I was to dedicate myself full time to one of the two of those, I'd probably still focus on the stock market because there's probably a lot more opportunities in that bigger, more complex market than the overall horse racing market. 
the, the one thing I'd add is the is the rule of thumb that that they say about poker, about you know betting and anything like investing in the stock market. If you can't spot the idiot at the table, it's you. So if you're trying to run an algorithmic trading strategy and you look around and you're like, wow, who else is doing algorithmic trading strategies? Citadel is going to eat your lunch. So, you know, you should, you should, you know, make sure that you spend the time to really know what you're doing. Otherwise you could find your lunch getting eaten pretty quickly. Yeah, the other, that's, that's actually really fascinating because I know a lot of engineers who have tried to build algorithmic strategies uh, and it was a completely different experience for what they expected because you're, you're entering, you know, red waters, I guess. It's like there's, there's, there's sharks in those waters that are trying to exploit the mistakes that your algorithm makes at every turn. Uh, so uh, the story is always the same. They'll build this really cool uh, back-tested trading algorithm and this works great. Yeah, we're going to set this up. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't work at all in the world. Sometimes it will do great at the start. Uh, and it's like, hey, yeah, we found this. We've, we've cracked it. We've got this algorithmic trading opportunity. Uh, and very quickly, you know, weeks or months, suddenly the profitability of that algorithm goes to zero uh, as uh, other agents in the market learn to exploit that. So it's something you have to constantly dedicate time to, to be constantly refining because it a, it's a competitive market. It's a competitive situation. One final point I will say that equates all of this stuff, I guess, uh, gambling, the stock market, startups. Uh, another really good rule of thumb for evaluating these markets is look at what the VIG is. Uh, now, the VIG is the amount that the house takes. You know, in poker, it's like the amount that you, you know, pay to the dealer from every hand. In, in horse betting, uh, they take a cut of the pot off the top and deliver it to the house. Uh, that, can, that number changes a lot, actually, depending on your market. Uh, you know, poker, it's a couple percent of a hand. Uh, horse racing is actually quite large. Uh, it can be 15, 20, 25 percent of the total betting pool, which is terrible because that just makes it harder to win, right? If, when you take out huge amounts off the top like that, you have to be even more competitive than everybody else uh, than, say, it were a zero sum game. Interestingly enough, both startups and the stock market have a negative VIG. It's, it's less than a zero sum game. So it's like the, the stock market expands and overall like even if you just buy an index fund you're going to grow by seven eight percent a year so that actually adds opportunities because the entire market grows uh startups i would argue are probably the most negative vig of all right because uh, it's the it's the ultimate grow the pie opportunity basically uh and uh if you do your job right at a startup and you achieve hyperscale and you're a market that's that's you know achieving very rapid growth which is why coming back to that original tam understanding the tam is important Spotting the platform chip is important. That's because you have a massively negative VIG, you know, across your entire market and across your startup is just uh, setting you up for more success. Yeah. And it's also just a lot more fun to work on positive sum things yeah. because, yeah. you know, it's not zero sum, like, like someone else can also win. Like, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you're, you're not competing over like a pie of a certain size. I think a good example like that illustrates that is, is Uber. You know, Uber started out and it was like, oh man, it's the zero sum thing with the taxis. It's either going to be the taxis or it's going to be Uber. The overall global taxi market, I don't have the actual data on how much it grew, but it grew a lot. Um, and that's because, you know, they were able to actually grow the entire pie, not just for themselves, but for, you know, other competitors in the market. And, you know, just, you know, that sort of taxi like transportation in general. So it's just a lot of fun to work on things where you you can you succeeding doesn't necessitate someone else failing. Yeah, and well, it's just it's a lot more fun of, on a personal level. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think in the light of this uh, newly found knowledge of mine, I'm gonna stick with my ETF. It's for the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, okay. I think that's a very reasonable approach. Glad we found that. Okay, a very interesting question now, and that might be more important and possibly dangerous than asteroids hitting Earth, uh, and then uh, all other probabilities in which uh, we perish. What if uh, a bigger threat that's emerging comes before any of those problems, which is the AI race between China and US. And uh, that is becoming worse and worse. Um, even people in US are sick of that. Um, Jensen 
of Nvidia, you know, he is not happy about that. A lot of other people think, you know, this is unnecessary fight that the U.S. is picking. Well, of course, there are people on the other side as well. You guys, you're well traveled, well educated. Um, you have your opinion of your own. Where do you think this is going? Like the the sort of like AI competition with China. Well, technology in general, and military, and everything else. <laughs> I mean, I think it it will only like get more intense. So, I mean, I, I wasn't alive during the Cold War, but just historically, like looking at that process, it's basically like an arms race is is a race, and it's and it's pretty serious. So, I think you'll probably see more companies like Andrew, uh, Palmer Luckey's company, that's you know a lot of like technology and defense. You'll probably see more companies like that happening, both on like the U.S. side, and obviously China will keep you know investing heavily. So, it's. I think that's just sort of the sort of reality. I think it's interesting because it, this the the conflict is really bringing home the point that this all ends with the hardware, right? Uh, and there's always been kind of like an undertone over the last you know thirty years of computing that hardware enables software, but it's really coming to a head now uh, because of the hardware needs of uh, you know what AI requires in terms of compute power, and uh, it's fascinating. Because you know, even OpenAI, I know there was like a, a leaked Sam Altman interview uh, where they asked him what his biggest concern was, and he said it's that we're so GPU blocked right now. Uh, I mean, that's why Nvidia is now a trillion dollar corporation, or was briefly a trillion dollar corporation. You, you know, because this hardware is actually really hard to get right, and I think the the heart of this conflict just happens to be you know TSMC and like the 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 very difficult to reproduce magic that happens uh, in Taiwan, for instance, uh, we're now seeing that have implications all over the place. Of course, that is central to the US-China conflict. Uh, it also brings up the discussion of sort of onshoring uh, back into America. I don't know, the TSMC, I think, is building a fab in, in Arizona. Is it somewhere in the States, uh, you know, an onshore fab? And, you know, we're seeing stuff like the Gigafactory, for instance, uh, being located onshore. So, uh, you know, that is all I think fueling the fire of, I think, what Paul accurately describes is like another iteration of the Cold War. And we're seeing, we're seeing this time, you know, what's being built is different. Uh, I guess that depends on your Doom review. If it's, you know, stockpiling arsenals is more or less dangerous than stockpiling AI capabilities. But it feels like a lot of the themes are really rhyming, doesn't it? I think, uh, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better is the one thing I know for sure. I don't know how it's going to resolve itself yet, but I think it's something that uh, you know I'm anxiously watching, and I think it's definitely something that we're going to need to very keep a very close eye on. Uh, you know, everyone in the world needs to really be careful and understand what's happening there. And, and one, one thing I would like jump into, um, you know, as a as a red blooded American, it's like this is something that the U.S. needs to win. Like, you know, this is this is the country of your Come freedom. On. You're bringing chauvinism to the do- debate. <laughs> No, but it, yeah. but it's like, well, you know, US has to win this. And it's like, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, like starting starting an AI company, it's like, you know, it's like, if you go and start this company in China, or you, you know, like move this technology over to China, and you're increasing their capabilities versus like the US's capabilities, like, I think it's a problem. And I think that's, you know, pr- probably not the whole reason. But I mean, Sequoia just recently, you know, divested their their China arm into a mm-hmm. into a separate entity. Mm-hmm. I think that just kind of highlights like that the development of technology is a really big lever, like we're talking about now in, you know, this sort of US China like Cold War that's happening. So yeah, it's, let, it's let a, me jump in as someone time. who's not a red blooded American. Uh as you know, I'm I'm Canadian originally. Uh and my my experience in America has been roughly seven years so far. And I will say, so they've been seven tumultuous years, right? There's been all sorts of things that have been going on over the past seven years. And and people, uh, you know, love to focus on a lot of the crazy stuff that's been happening, basically, and all sorts of uh, just uh, schisms politically. And uh, America can be a tumultuous place, basically. But my experience with it, it's, it's th- that seven years of craziness actually kept out with like, OpenAI was still an American corporation, which is still really pushed the state of the art of what's possible with this new, very important technology. And I think it's funny because I, I, 
uh, you know, I, I'm voting with my feet. I, I choose to be in America, but I don't have any, you know, like from birth uh, objective towards America. But I will say that I'm very proud to be in the nation that uh, it's not a coincidence that America produced, uh, you know, the, 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 the most capable LLM in the world, for instance, you know. Uh, it's not a it's not a coincidence that the iPhone was designed here, uh, and and I I do have a lot of faith and uh, a lot of confidence in the system that's able to consistently, you know, outpace the world in in this research. Uh, I really do believe uh, that America can do that. So uh, I would say that I'm, despite not uh, being a red blood American, I, I do share Paul's faith. Uh, I will say actually there is it's it's funny he mentions freedom and stuff like that, and there is certain implications here for developing this tech. And, you know, you hear stories out of China, how the amount of restriction that they're trying to put on, on LLM is actually crippling the research progress. And this is all very anecdotal. And I don't know if this is the case or not, but it, it sure makes for a, a really interesting narrative. I, I don't know if you have seen um, a report that's published every year. It's called State of the AI Report by Nathan Benai. Um, um, it's a VC based out of London. And, and yeah. It is a fact that even in open AI, some of the top researchers are from China. You know, uh, China ha is leading the AI research. You know, in most manufacturing industries, they're the one who are taking things out. Um, China is far ahead in middle technology um, and pretty much all their technologies. So, in all fair fairness, um, if you look at the future, which is not star spangled, what do you think? is going to happen if for just for argument's sake, we envision a world that is based on cooperation and mutual in, in, in trust. And trust me, I come from a region that is not very happy with US. Well, I will say one so, thing, uh, let me jump in first, Paul. Uh, yeah, what this no, actually okay. jumps in, this, this speaks to me as a business intelligence expert because part of this is choosing the metrics that matter. I think it's a big, important part of BI and analytics. And I love the state of AI. Uh, I, I've been a paper reviewer for uh, a lot of the leading uh, ML conferences in the past, things like that. And uh, definitely keep a close eye on who is publishing the most research. Uh, and China is very much a leader there. Interestingly, another side fact is that a lot of the great research in America seems to come out of corporations instead of research institutions, right? So like, I think the leading American research institution is not Stanford, but it's Google or Facebook, for instance. But, you know, I, I definitely keep a close eye on the fact that China publishes a lot of the research uh, and you know, there's a ton of important research happening in China. But if you look at the metric of, you know, AI implementation, you, you know, there's 100 million users of ChatGPT. Uh, you know, the, 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 the practical application of this technology, I think, is being led in America and also in Europe, but like, I'd say generally, you know, uh, led, led by the West, I would say. So, so I would agree with Ryan that it's led, but I, that definitely doesn't guarantee that that's the future. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, Ch China is a, is a formidable research force and, you know, they have tons of smart people and tons of resources that they're dedicating to, to like advance their, their own technology. So it's very much not, not a slam dunk. Uh, that the U.S. is going to be leading here. Yeah, I mean, we work yeah. with um, some of the think tanks in China, and I can tell you they have no shortage of talent. And a lot of U.S. researchers, um, well, thankfully, now that H-1B visas and you know, other things are becoming harder in the U.S., they're, they're willing to go back to China. Actually, Baidu, their whole AI department was um, built by U.S. researchers, like Chinese origin U.S. researchers who went back um, and did it uh, for them. And now Baidu is actually um, launching their own uh, bot. I think it's, an, it's called Ernie. Um, and there's huge um, funding um, that's emerging in China. I was looking at the report, uh, which says that um, there's around $400 million um, coming for a company called MinMax. I don't know if you've got the name right. But there's a lot of funding that's emerging, and that's partially as a consequence um, of this uh, emerging Cold War, where they don't feel secure, um, and especially after um, the decision of uh, U.S. to freeze the funds um, of Russian um, sovereign funds and other banks. Um, that was a surprise for a lot of other companies who are wary of their investments um, in the U.S. and they start thinking about decoupling or at least you know, offsetting the risk that the U.S. does something um, crazy. And so I think that's kind of a 
byproduct um, of the, the policies. Like, how do you see this development? Could it be the unintended consequence that China becomes the AI leader because of the AI and because of the U.S. policies? It it might be. I, I think it's just a little bit too too foggy to say, though. Like the, I think that's kind of like the you know both both countries basically have tons of formidable resources or tons of formidable researchers huge amounts of resources that they can develop to this. I mean, I mean, Microsoft just invested $10 billion, largely in cloud credits, but like $10 billion in open AI. Like that's just a huge amount of resources developed uh, to this, to this project. So like, you know, I think, I think both countries have tons of good researchers, tons of resources, and it's really just a question of execution. It's like, who can, who can actually push the state of the art forward and, I don't think it's something you can know with a ton of certainty right now, either way, you know? So that's not a very sensational <laughs> answer, but. <laughs> <laughs> one, th- one thing I will say is I've told Paul this before, and this is not just true for the AI race, but just, just in general, is that like, uh, I, everyone, I, you know, I've always wondered that when I become an old guy and I'm always, what, you know, I've always say, what am I going to complain about that things were better in my day or whatever? Uh, and as someone who keeps up with technology, I don't think I'm going to feel like I'm ever going to be left behind technologically or, you know, things like that. But it's emerging now. I'm realizing that, you know, when I'm an old guy, I'm going to look back uh, at the time when we had a smaller world. You know, and when I was starting my career, uh, you know, I've I've worked extensively in all these countries and uh, would travel extensively to them. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of had this idea that, things always went up and to the right. This, you know, the, the arc of the universe was uh, you know, up and to the right. And it turns out it is actually long because there are times when that level of openness does not monotonically increase, you know, and when borders close and when conflict arises. And unfortunately, I thought, you know, 10 years ago, we had kind of solved that and that, you know, we're moving to increase globalization. Uh, and the thing that I'm going to look back at as an old guy is I'm going to say, man, I, I miss the days when we were more global. And uh, I, I, you, to your point, there's phenomenal researchers of uh, many, many origins in all of these organizations. Uh, and I sincerely hope we return to a time of, of increased globalization and where that continues to increase, because I think that's good for everybody. So personally, I, I would say I really hope that this trend reverts. Uh, will, it or, will it not? I'm not sure. One, one other thing I will add is in the, in the arms race, one thing that we haven't discussed yet, uh, we've talked about American China. I would say that there's a lot of merit. That those are both, as as Paul says, just powerful research-driven organizations or countries or uh, institutions or whatever you want to call them. One, one thing that's, uh, I think, actually becoming more clear to me is that Europe's approach to this technology is to really hit the gas on regulation. And it, it's, it strikes me as out of like the three big or like approaches to it, that one I feel like uh, is probably going to, be the least productive. <laughs> uh, I feel like this is pretty early to regulate this technology. For the reasons I said before, I think if, if there, I think a doomer scenario is unlikely, and even if it is, it's a long, long ways away, and we don't even understand this technology yet. So, uh, the one approach that I would really take exception to is the, the, you know, let's regulate this heavily now approach. Yeah, the the one thing I'd add to that too is like one of the. I don't think there is an issue inherently with regulation, but I think the the problem is that if people push for just sort of stopping things without a kind of solution, without like a solution, you know, where they're just kind of like, yeah, just stop. Then, you know, that that's not mm-hmm. really like effective regulation. That's not regulation that helps push the industry forward, that helps, you know, mm-hmm. actually like improve the quality. It just stops the thing from happening. So mm-hmm. I think the problem with like, a lot of European approaches that they just kind of say stop. And, you know, good regulation is important. Like it's, you know, important that we have seatbelts in cars and that you're required to, you know, wear those seatbelts. But it's like that also came from having to figure out what, where is it important to have that? Like, like where, yeah. where are the right, mm-hmm. what are the right levers exactly. to actually use? So I think the problem now is that people are, you know, trying to issue, you know, six months moratoriums on progress. And it's like, okay, for what purpose? Like, what do you propose would, you know, make this actually like the kind of progress that you want? And if there's no solution to that, mm-hmm. if there's no like real solutionism on like what should happen to make this technology, you know, helpful and good for humans, then you can't just say stop all progress because 
because I say so, basically. Yeah, I think as someone who studied in Europe and lived there for <clears throat> quite some time, I could kind of get their mindset um, in the sense that their argument, or let's say um, the retort for your statement is that uh, about the, about the car anal analogy is that when are you going to stop when it's crashed already? Like with the mirror um, totally um, done for and, you know, the bonus out and everything else. Like, you know, shouldn't we do it before then um, after? And, and there's some um, sanity to their element in the sense that, you know, they come from a, a preservation and, um, you know, preventative measure um, mindset. And um, with the U.S., it's all like break things, um, you know, and, you know, just uh, smash it on the wall and see if it sticks. Uh, and that is very good for innovation, but not as much for, let's say, safety and privacy, which, is our, which are huge concerns uh, for European regulators. And now they have, I think it was yesterday, mm -hmm. they voted for the EI, um, um, EU AI Act, and, you know, it's been passed, and I think uh, it will be in full um, effect uh, next year, um, this time. And so I want to just... just bring you guys in to talk about a little about this eu act i don't know if you've um read uh, the, the the draft um and then like do you really think this is going to impede the progress or do you think it's going to give the necessary framework and put a check on um u.s unbridled innovation or love for progress without any concern about safety so 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 one thing i'd say is that the the problem isn't one of just like not putting the the like seat belts in the right place. The problem I think is one of complexity in the sense that you don't know where to put the seat belts. Like, you know, mm -hmm. when when we were first creating cars, it's like, do you need seat belts? Where do you put them? Like you you, you actually just fundamentally do not know like what to do. Like 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 what regulation is important and where it needs to be applied to actually be effective. So, you know, you could have said, hey, these car things, you're putting like flammable stuff in them. This is a bad idea. Like, let's just not do this. And there's, there's kind of merit to that. You can also say, Hey, let's put, you know, restraining devices on everything. You can only turn the steering wheel like so far each time that probably would have caused more harm than good. You couldn't turn quickly to react to something. So it's like, just from the fundamental complexity of not understanding what this new technology is, just like every technology we invent, we don't fully understand it. We have something that's, that's useful and we can use before we understand fully like w how we should actually use it, like, like where the, the right places are. So I think pr prematurely you could actually cause more harm than good because you just don't actually know like where, where the right, the right levers are. Yeah. I'd, I'd say to extend the analogy totally in favor of, regulation for in, in for safety and promoting privacy and, and everything. Uh, but in, in this analogy, the car hasn't been invented yet. You know, it's like we're asking a regulator to, uh, we're in the era of horses and buggies and to look ahead and say, hey, listen, however a car might be built in the future, how would you, how do you think we should regulate that now? And I think it's a, you know, I, I can't tell you what comes next. Uh, I think about this stuff very deeply from the top down to the bottom up and, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't predict the future either. So I, I think it's very important. And as an aside, as data people first, like Paul and I probably uh, think a lot more about privacy and we're probably a lot more pro uh, really enforcing privacy and uh, data protection than a lot of other people are. Uh, I think it's really important, but I think we just don't know what comes next or what's ahead of us yet. And it's going to be very difficult to write effective legislation at this point. Yeah, I totally get it. But let me give you a different lens, if it were to see um, the same situation. Like you use LLMs uh, in the power of semantic layer to make it sensible and, you know, make decisions or let's say give you inputs or outputs um, that are um, hu humanly logical. But what if it happens in a realm uh, which is, is considered disinformation? We're talking about generative AI, you know, creating photos, you know, text to image, you know, like image attacks, um, summarization, recommendation. Um, and it, mind you that we are still in the court. Um, there are so many lawsuits pending against um, OpenAI for infringing uh, the copyrights of the creators. And it's the same thing with Adobe. I published about that on my LinkedIn uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago about how they're in hot waters about um, the data that they train their model on. 
Um, and and mm-hmm. it's same with stability, AI, and mid-journey. Um, so knowing that it's already in deep waters, do, don't you think there is a realistic chance that it's uh, contributing to misinformation? We saw uh, this Balenciaga jacket that the Pope was uh, wearing um, it kind of became <laughs> the hot model for uh, the brand. Um, and that didn't really exist. And we had Trump uh, being dragged on the roads. Uh, so the defects can be used and abused. Um, I don't know if you've seen that, this um, image of Pentagon being bombed um, the other day. You know, and the stock market kind of almost crashed uh, because of that. Uh, and it turned out it was fake, of course. So I think there are some real risks. Don't you think so? There, there definitely are, but I think the the problem is that for those things, the cat's kind of out of the bag. Like, you know, some of these models are open source. It's like you can, I could buy a computer for a few grand and run this on my computer for some of these smaller models. And it's kind of like, for that kind of thing, the cat's out of the bag. Like no amount of regulation is going to stop a bad actor. A lot of the things you can do that are genuinely deceptive and are genuinely bad, like in terms of speech, in terms of, you know, false information trying to like engineer an outcome those are actually still illegal like those are illegal right now and it's like you know you just need to prosecute people who try to you know move the market via like intentionally incorrect information yeah but you see this is the argument this is the argument they say that if the cat is out of the bag and everyone has this technology then instead of punishing people who abuse the technology just remove the source of the bad behavior, which is like this technology doesn't become rampant and everyone has that. So I mean, the EU is thinking proactive in the sense, but you think that the technology itself is not bad. It's just how you use uh, things is bad, if I got it correct. Yeah, absolutely. It's like you can use technology for good or for bad. And it's kind of like, I think one of the things that people miss with this is it's like, this has been possible for a long time. Like you could take a day and go through and create a Pope in Balenciaga jacket thing in Photoshop. It's like, It's going to take a lot of effort, but you can do that. So this really just increases the speed at which these things happen. So increasing the speed, you know, maybe changes some things, but it's sort of like what is or is not illegal. That's largely already like encoded in laws pretty effectively. You know, you can't commit libel. You can't commit libel by something you say yourself or something you prompt an AI to say, and then you post. So, you know, it's like a lot of these things that are actually illegal are already considered illegal and, you know, will and should be prosecuted as such. Yeah, I think, I think the, the comp, the, it's, it's a complex issue, no doubt. And I, I think the, the core of it actually reminds me of like an analogy with airlines. And, you know, if there's, if there's, if a commercial airliner uh, were to crash on landing or, or something terrible happens, they, they very rarely go to the pilot of that airliner. They usually go to the manufacturer. They go to Boeing or they go to Airbus and they say, okay, you know, what did, what did you do wrong to make this airplane crashable, right? Uh, and like the core of this issue is really like if someone builds uh, hate speech with generative AI, like is it, is it the pilot or is it the plane that's at fault there, right? So I, th- I think it gets very, very complicated, but I think we need to ensure the legal frameworks uh, and the societal frameworks that still hold the pilot responsible and, you know, recognize that generative AI as, 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 the, as a tool, which I think is what I've said, you know, previously in this conversation is that these things at the end of the day are tools and they're being used by humans to achieve an end. So, but it's very, and very complicated. May, you know, just play devil's advocate to this argument about the pilot thing. You know, some would argue that, um, hey, I just sell Coke. I don't use it. You know, other people use it. So, you know, that's still illegal, you know. Yeah. Yep. And it's and it's and it's like, illegal. Like like it should be, you know, it should be like <laughs> like like that we have laws for a reason. <laughs> like, yeah, but some people, people argue do. that this technology yeah. if it's bringing bad behavior in the people, so now you should nip the evil in the bud. Um so in that regard, they're kind of evaluating LLMs with coke and marijuana, which is legal by the way in some states. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I but I think the the analogy there is it's 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 not like it will induce you to do yeah the alum's not going to like hit you up and be like hey have you thought about you know trying to move the market with insider yeah. uh, you know fake insider <laughs> information today you know that's something that you're doing and you're just using you know that as an accelerant so it's just kind of like just like you could use a word processor to you know more easily type a document that's fraudulent than you know write it out by hand. It's kind of like these things are just tools 
they're really powerful tools and you can create things really, really quickly. But I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that they are, that they are tools. And we need to think about, you know, ways that they can be misused and make sure that we have tools for managing that tools for, you know, labeling, Hey, this content looks AI generated. This content doesn't. So it's important to have tools for, for dealing with them. But I think it's important that the, the, they are tools and the human doing the stuff with them is responsible for that. Yeah, I hear you. Well, we have talked about, you know, the, um, unprecedented advances in AI. We've talked about research. We've talked about VCs. Let's talk about the source of all this, which are people and you as employers who hire people, you know, very meticulous about the kind of people that you want to work with and what they have done. And you have also have very diverse and interesting backgrounds. Let's talk a little bit about the whole education sector that we live in. Uh, according to that report, State of AI report, the, literally the contribution of academia in AI is 0% because most of the research is coming from this big organization of research institutes, Meta and Microsoft and Beidou, Stanford and Beijing Institute of uh, Sciences. And the dwindling level of education and uh, turn off your um, Ivy League sector and outside that, you know, education is... Uh, let's say not spectacular. Um, and then we have uh, open courses and uh, Coursera, Udemy, things like this where people can educate themselves. Um, and that's happening at a rapid pace. Do you think that we're in kind of a intellectual decline in the sense that um, universities don't offer the quality that they used to? Or let's say market is now more open and fair in the sense that uh, employers want top talent, regardless of if, if they went to college or not. So, so I think, so I think there's, there's a few different things there. One, I would say the U S generally is behind in STEM. Like if you just compare like the U S to India or China or, you know, any of the Asian countries, mm -hmm. like, you know, yeah, their STEM programs are impressive. Like, like, I mean, we went yeah. to school with a lot of people who were, who were international and, you know, had that, that background and just their high school level STEM you know, education is incredible. Um, and the U S definitely needs to, to step up its, its game there. I think in universities, so it's like my, I can speak to, you know, just my experience at Harvard. I can't really speak too much to, to other people's experiences, but the quality of the people there were, you know, amazing. And I mean, they should be right. But like the quality of the people there, the quality of education was, was fantastic for, for that. Yeah. They don't count. I would, yeah, that's <laughs> I, I would say that I, uh, so personally, I felt like, you know, my master's degree prepared me very effectively to be able, it gave me, it gave me uh, the foundation for me to really understand that how the technology works and, and sort of keep up with the developments uh, from a high level with, you know, with LLMs. And I, I feel like I look at empirically again, a lot of our class went to go and do sort of quasi research roles at those organizations that are now publishing the papers. Uh, so I will say that like results wise, uh, I think the answer is yes, that, you know, the universities uh, are an important institution. Uh, I would say the counter argument of that uh, is going back to, you know, what I was saying about how fast this technology is moving. Uh, and I would say that I don't have any, particular data on this, but it seems to be sort of speeding up uh, and there's new developments every week. And we did have situations. I remember one class that Paul and I took, even back when we were studying, the the prof sort of sat down and said, well, here's what the lesson plan I was going to do was, uh, but this was wiped out, you know, last week by this latest development that breaks the state of the art. And this stuff is all, it turns out it's the wrong direction. So we're going to have to rebuild and go in this direction instead. Uh, and even at the time, you know, the pace was so fast that it was, it was hard to keep up with, uh, you know, like a rigorous academic approach. And I, I, I suspect that as things have been continuing to accelerate, it's probably pretty tough for professors to keep up with and teach, you know, the latest thing that's been happening and changing week by week. So I would say the case against would actually be a question of pacing. Yeah. And then, then one, one thing to, to hop in on that, it's like the, you know, if, if that's true, which I think it is, that it's like the, the pace of the information you have to keep up with is just really, really fast. 
you know, how do you create a system that lets people keep up with that? The only way to do it is to have a system that instills a high level of curiosity in the individual. Because only you, self-directed, are going to act, like, if you want to, you will keep up with everything. If you don't want to, you have no chance of keeping up with that, everything. So mm-hmm. it's like, how do you create a system that instills curiosity in the students? And I think that's a problem that's not, like, universities. Usually, people are probably formed enough as as humans by the time they get there that they're either, you know, pretty curious or they're not. But I think that's probably the, like, in terms of, you know, U.S., like, lower lower education i guess like elementary school and middle school like that's the stuff that they need to be focusing on is making kids curious and just nurturing that because all children are inherently curious and having a system that promotes that and um you know just makes more kids curious will help kind of solve its own problem as you get to like rapidly um improving technologies so yeah what other thing worth adding kind of become the yeah, go ahead uh, one other thing worth adding there, it, it, it becomes magnified when pace is in, it becomes the critical factor. But this comes back to what I was saying earlier about the metrics that matter. And there there is a bit of a misalignment of incentive between academia and industry. I would say we don't know exactly what the right impact metric is yet for this technology. But I think we can agree that the right measure is probably not uh, you know, number of citations or, uh, you know, the sort of behavior that leads to, you know, paper stuffing type stuff in, in academia that just produces uh, a lot of redundant research, for instance. And, you know, I think there's a there's a misalignment of incentives there that is is holding back the pace of research in academia as well, or that uh, at least holding back the effectiveness of academia, that if there's a better way to align incentives, and there's certain mechanisms for this, you know, there's a lot of universities are, are good at sort of commercializing development. Stanford's a leader in this, for instance. You know, if there is more systems like that that align these incentives in the transition of, you know, research into the real world, uh, I think that would also be sort of good for everyone. Yeah, I think you have made a very good point with um, incentives because I'm kind of a poster child of now in praising the Scandinavian education system, which has been the best um, by many standards. You know, they are top scores mm-hmm. in PISA every year. And one of the things that I noticed there is that, and that was really surprising for me coming from a very competitive um, high school university um, background uh, to a system where there are no grades. So they, they simply don't have grades um, till you're 11 years old. So there's no competition in the sense of what the focus is on critical thinking and inventing um, and thinking out of the box. And this is why there are only like 9, 10 million people uh, coming with the great ideas, companies like Ikea and H&M uh, and Volvo. Um, and I think that's, that's something, at, at some point, this has, this slipped off of the radar um, in the U.S. education system. It's, it ranked like 45th or something in math scores in high school. Um, and, uh, and a lot of that I would attribute uh, to foreign students that come to the U.S. Um, you know, first after the disintegration of Russia. So a lot of Russian scientists came, um, the Chomsky's yep. um, and the ilk of that, and then Indians and Southeast Asians. Um, that, that that was kind of a booming period of the U.S. intellectual uh, landscape. Look at Princeton, 1930. You know, such a collection of minds, you know. But sorry, go on. <laughs> No, no, I was just making the point that, you know, it's it's not necessarily at high school level where um, the U.S. excels. Um, it's probably the university level where um, it is, the thinking is promoted by a lot of diversity um, and internationalization and globalization and the allocation of resources. And then the patent system, of course, that um, incentivize of the development of the things. And that, by the way, is one of the, well, let's say not so positive thing in the European infrastructure, and a lot of VCs complain about that, that the university system does not incentivize researchers um, in EU as much as it does in US. I totally get this point, but how is that affecting your ability to source uh, talent uh, for analytic um, and in general job market for the US? Do you think it's going to remain competitive? Oh yeah, I, I think the US job market will remain like super competitive. And I think the biggest reason for that is that, you know, like like the U S is kind of like the all-star team. It's like, that's where, that's where generally you want to go. Like you're going to make, you know, way more money in the U S than you are in Europe. 
than you are in basically any other country. So it's kind of it's kind of like the big leagues. So you know if you can if you can come here if you're talented and and you're international like you know not everyone but a lot of people want to come to the U.S. So I, I don't think the U.S. will have a problem keeping its its talent hopper full. Yeah, my my only addition is that like uh, like you, Minhaj, I I also spent a long time studying and living in, in Europe as well. So I have a I I have a balanced view on those two sides of the coin, and I think there is. I think there. I I I loved it when I lived in Europe. So I think Europe is an amazing place to live as well, and I can certainly see cases for 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 being there. And I might be back there someday. Who knows? But I would say empirically, having spent about seven years in both those places now, uh, I feel like I meet more people who have found and seized opportunity on this side of the ocean versus the European side. Let me put that way. So I feel like I've I've met more people who have. Uh, you know, found success and like just had really good ideas and good opportunities presented to them on the American side. Yeah. Well, some would argue that, you know, there is more to life than opportunity, but I guess each to their yeah. own. <laughs> and, yeah, but I uh, think diversity that, that is, is a very good yeah, thing. I, <laughs> no, but, it's, but it's a different, like, it's a different like philosophy, right? It's like you can, you know, you can like chill in Europe or you can like make it in the U S. So it's kind of like, those are both, they're, they're, it's like we were saying before, it's a strategy. Right, like the opposite makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. if the opposite makes sense, it is a strategy. So, <laughs> yeah, totally. I think diversity is a good in the sense that I've lived in Middle East. Um, we have company operations in Africa, and then I've lived in Europe, in Southeast Asia. And I, I think um, some sense of uh, you know, opposite is very good. So you need to travel in, in order to find out what's good um, in your home country and versus what other people are doing good. I think that gives you a very well balanced and impartial view of the word and what's going on around the world. But it's been a blast uh, talking to you guys. Just final question that what's out there in the pipeline for Zenlytic? Uh, what are the future plans? Uh, what's coming up? Um, and uh, how do you plan to take it uh, forward, hopefully to an IPO someday? That's right. So the uh, the next step in the hopper for us is, you know, more and more like Zoe functionality. Zoe is the future of how people, you know, are going to interact with the data. So that's everything from helping you set up Zenlytic, sending reports to people, you know, asking, um, you know, different questions, creating dashboards for you. That's uh, just more and more functionality um, with Zoe is is all the stuff that's that's on the roadmap for us. I would say the over the overarching arc is trying to move from what I would call sort of a you know reactive paradigm to a proactive paradigm and ultimately to a prescriptive paradigm. Uh, and, and you know, so right now Zoe is very good at answering your questions and, and having those discussions with you. But I can see a world not too long from now where uh, you log into Zenlytic uh, and you log into Zoe, and uh, Zoe says, "Oh, hi, Minhaj." This last week, you were asking a bunch of questions about our churn rate, uh, and you should know that overnight the churn rate has spiked by eleven percent. Like, do you want to look more into that? And you know, just that deeper level of understanding of why you're using the data and understanding what your needs are, and and helping you reach that, I guess, is the goal. And I guess the theme is that uh, you, you know it's a corny old stat: ninety percent of the world's data created in the last two years. There, there's more data than ever before. Uh, we want to make sure that you. Uh, have a short pipe to accessing and understanding that. Well, good luck with that. So hopefully, Synalytic or Zoe is going to become the next Siri. Well, maybe not Siri, but a little bit better than <laughs> <laughs> Siri for the BAs. And you're going to make a lot of uh, lazy business analysts happy uh, with your endeavors. So looking forward to that. Um, thank you so much, guys, for being on the show. It's been a ball talking to you guys. And I wish you best of luck for um, Zenlytic. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Uh, been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure.